So what I am going to talk about today, tonight, is um, the importance of preventative health care. And a lot of what I'm going to be talking about more than, you know, it, it's sort of a discussion about what we can be doing as equine practitioners to really promote, um, you know, preventative health care in horses and a little bit about, you know, what we have out there and what, what's, you know, tools that we have that we can, that we can use. So I guess the biggest question is, you know, why preventative health care? And on healthcare.gov, on the human side, you know, they say routine health care that includes screenings, checkups, patient counseling um, to prevent illness and other problems. That's, that's what they consider preventative health care. We've all heard, you know, that the, um, as the saying goes, the uh, um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, the AVMA talks about the cost of prevention um, actually being advantageous to the early diagnosis and increase the likelihood of successful outcomes. And, um, you know, we really talk about the fact that the reason that we would recommend them as veterinarians is the same reason in human medicine that it would be recommended, again, if you detect a problem in its early stages, it's much more likely that you're going to have um, a better success and also with less expense. So it seems, you know, pretty straightforward on why we have preventative health care. And I think the most important thing is, you know, for us, again, in veterinary medicine and in equine practice is, you know, proactive versus reactive medicine. And I think we tend to very much get into um, this situation where we are, are, you know, putting out fires, you know, um, we are not seeing a horse, uh, you know, regularly or routinely, but when the horse colics or um, has a, a lameness or something like that, we're running out and working on the, on the horse, but we're not really doing their general preventative health care and wellness. And so it's just constantly, you know, again, sort of putting out fires. Um, you know, why should we be doing preventative health care again? Like, you know, basic standard of care. It's, it's just, it's not only that it's good medicine, but I also think that if we are out there at the farms and yearly and part of the horse's health care, we are involving the veterinarians and sort of reclaiming the authority in health care. And I'll talk about that a little bit later too. Um, Horses are certainly living longer. You know, I have a lot of clients now whose horses are in their 30s and even 40s. And some of our clients, these are part of their family. They've had them for 30 years and um, they really have a greater attachment and they're looking for more, um, you know, preventative care, more yearly checkups, things that they can do to keep their horse healthy. And it also promotes a stronger relationship with the horse and the client and really getting to know the horses in your practice and the client by you know, keeping up that general relationship and not just seeing them during emergencies. So this is some information um, you know, from, the, from the AEP that they talk about, you know, again, forging relationships. And um, you know, this is some stuff that's pulled from their website is that if we, you know, if we think about the examination just as a clinical tool, we kind of miss that opportunity to use it as a relationship with the, the clients. And they surveyed all these horse owners and trainers and found that the relationship factor was really important for their, you know, ability to provide veterinary care. And these were the things that they came out of the survey is that clients really want you to take your time with the horse during the exam or visit. They don't want you to just like run in, do the thing that you have to do and run back out. They want you to take the time to explain the diagnosis and treatment recommendations um, in a way that they can really understand it. And they want to see that you have compassion for the horse and that you're, you know, you're taking the time with their horse and that you value their opinion as well. So, you know, again, all of this is, has to do with the relationship with your, with your client and also getting to know the horse better. Um, certainly economic considerations. Um, there are, there are many articles, but there, you know, there are certainly some 
people like Ben Buchanan. He's got a really successful practice in Texas, and he's written some articles about translating, you know, equine wellness into a, a business model and how you can promote it and increase, um, you know, the economics of your practice. And then there was um, a survey that was done by Merck Henry Scheid and AEP, and this, you know, looked also at the economic considerations for. Uh, wellness programs, health programs, whatever you want to call it. And in their conclusions, they found that um, some the challenges of the economy over the last, you know, seven or eight years has affected the economics of equine practice and um, also changes in equine industry. But there are many opportunities to um, that we have to improve management and have um, a significant impact. And I think one of those is through you know, again, routine healthcare that we can, um, you know, we can consider that an economic advantage and bringing that back into our practice. So, you know, certainly there are some concerns and obstacles as to, you know, what we face, you know, as a practitioner. And um, one of them has been, in some ways, there has been a pivot away from veterinary healthcare, where you know oftentimes owners are getting information from lay sources rather than from veterinarians. I mean, I have people who are like, yeah, you know, the chiropractor said, the person who massages the horse, you know, said this, or the person at the feed store told me this, and you know, I think that we really need to again kind of regain the authority as the person to go to about your horse's health care. There are some owners that are doing their own health care. The AEP does have a lot of stuff on their website. I'm not going to get into that today, just about the um, about vaccinating and how, you know, dealing with owners that are purchasing their own vaccine, purchasing their own dewormer, and sort of doing their own health care and how we can sort of get that back into, you know, our practices and our our purview as their veterinarian, um, you know, online pharmacies, people ordering, you know, again, drugs, vaccines, dewormer, whatever they happen to order, and Dr. Google, you know, getting on there and sort of making their own diagnoses, finding out their own stuff, and um, and not always looking to the veterinarian for for the health care of their horse. So, you know, in in this search, and I did sort of my own research in, in doing this talk, and I was really interested about equine healthcare guidelines, and really, are there any? You can see, if you go on the AVMA website, there are a lot of um, healthcare guidelines on the small animal side, but I couldn't really find any for equine. And um, I think historically, when people think of the, you know, healthcare, they think of vaccination and deworming. And, and a lot of people, if you ask them or barn managers and owners and you say, you know, what, what is your, your healthcare program? They um, think that we're just asking who vaccinates your horse, who does the deworming and sort of as a herd healthcare, but not really beyond that. And so then, you know, what should an annual, annual health program include and where should these guidelines be posted for not only us as equine practitioners, but also for clients to be aware of what, you know, what we're recommending for what their horse should have every year. And, and back to veterinarians should really be the source of this information. So, um, you know, while I was looking at all this, I was thinking, well, what kind of client education do we do? Are we educating our clients on preventative health care? And are we using any of the tools that we have? And I think what really surprised me was that I started looking at some of the layperson magazines that clients are reading. And there, there's actually quite a bit of stuff on wellness and preventative health care that our clients are getting. And maybe we're not uh, piggybacking off of that and continuing the conversation. And, um, you know, this is from the horse magazine. And, you know, here, you know, money saving preventative care for managing your horse. Well, there, that's awesome right there. Um, Semi-annual visits that include vaccination and dental exams, also blood work, fecal leg count, nutrition consults, and they're describing wellness steps. Um, this is from the AEP here, you know, having an annual wellness exam. So in fact, 
you know, clients are actually seeing this in, in some of these journals. There, there's more, you know, the Chronicle of the Horse, stay on top of your horse's health with annual wellness exams and the horse source again, you know, and, um, and some of this stuff, many equine veterinarians offer wellness packages. So I think what, what was interesting to me is I didn't necessarily realize that clients were actually getting this from what they were reading, but, but we need to reinforce it as, as veterinarians. And I'm not sure we're always very good about that. So what resources do we have? You know, on the AEP website, there are some resources. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you can read talking about the examination and, and again, back to that survey and having satisfied clients and, you know, really uh, forging that relationship with the client. And they go on to even provide things like these tools in your practice, and they have um, they have forms that you can download that show you know that you or you can take information from and make your own form that has healthcare guidelines, frequency of visit, what you should be looking at in your health evaluation. This is all on the AEP website. So these things really you know, you have to dig a little bit sometimes to find these. I, I had to work around the site a little bit, but, but actually there are some really good guidelines. And I find that it's interesting that we have all of this stuff, yet a lot of the practices that I talk to are not really implementing these in their, um, in their practice. And, and, you know, I, I wonder why, right? So I think that brings in the discussion of, should be included in a health program. And I think that's what a lot of the conversations I've had with veterinarians have said, well, you know, there, there's a lot of different things and, you know, maybe they offer different levels or different package, you know, packages. And I think it can be practice dependent, you know, what it is that you want to offer, what kind of practice you have, if you, you know, are, you know, doing just repro or racehorses or just a little bit of everything, you know, and then also there are differences within your practice and the scope of the type of horse that you see from their age, their use, you know, performance, pleasure, retired, whatever. And of course, economic considerations within your clients. But there's a lot of things that we could potentially, you know, offer in a health program. Um, I think some common things to consider when we're looking at the different age groups, you know, this is obviously just very basic, but, you know, in a, in a young horse, what things might we be worried about? You know, yearly, you're going to want to look. What is their growth like? Their um, nutrition, talking to the clients about their nutrition and, and how are they growing on the musculoskeletal side? You don't want to miss any joint problems or, you know, tendon problems or, you know, anything or any concerns that, a, that a, an owner might have. You know, in, in a middle-aged horse, what about the same thing? Nutrition, how are they performing? You're starting to get into that age where maybe you're going to have some endocrine issues that like early PPID or insulin dysregulation, um, you know, listening to their heart, what drugs are they on, you know, other things like that. And then, of course, back to that older horse when horses are living older, you know, they have different nutritional requirements, you know, dental disease becomes even more important as does endocrine um, and their heart, even whether they're ridden or not ridden. A lot of people, again, these are like their pets, they want to keep them healthy and maybe they do need to have a good cardiac exam. Um, and, you know, just reviewing what, what kinds of um, drugs that they might be getting or supplements or other things. So I think within a practice, you know, these are different things we need to consider. And, and if we're not doing a good yearly exam, what things could we be missing? We certainly could be missing, a, you know, cardiac murmur or arrhythmia. There, I do a lot of cardiology in my practice, and there are many times when if I, I'm seeing a horse for a murmur and I say, well, when was the last time your horse was sculpted and the you know they may say I have no idea you know um, no one's really needed to listen to my horse and sometimes people listen before they do a dental or before a vaccine but not like a really good auscultation listening to both sides of the thorax you know really taking the time and so 
in trying to figure out and, and put a timeline to it, which can be very important for a, a murmur or arrhythmia, I don't have that baseline data. Um, same thing with endocrine disease. If you really detect changes in the body condition because you're seeing this horse every year and, you know, doing a, a, a good exam, maybe you can catch something early before they lose a lot of mus muscle condition or get the curly hair coat, you know, or have a decrease in their performance or that the owner's noticing these things and you can have early detection and try to, you know, head it off at the pass. Also things, you know, again, just like, you know, general nutri nutrition or their skin, lumps and bumps, ocular changes, um, you know, lab changes. So there, there's a lot of things that I think we're leaving on the table that we could be missing because we're not doing a good, um, I think the biggest thing is the physical exam and it sounds so basic, but honestly, it is the most overlooked thing. And, and that does include auscultation of the heart. But there are a lot of times when just a really good physical exam every year is not something that's done. You know, uh, people are sort of running through the barn and doing their vaccines, their dewormer, um, whatever they happen to do. But, you know, again, a really good thorough physical exam is not being done. Um, and, and nutrition, you know, that's another one. Um, really looking and talking to the clients about what they're feeding their horses, what their body condition looks like, what they may need different because of a, um, you know, a change in their performance, whether it's a change up or a change down, what supplements they're on. I mean, people go absolutely nuts over supplements. And there are times I'd say the most common time that I get involved with something like that is if I'm seeing a horse for a gastrointestinal problem, whether it's for the potential for ulcers or diarrhea or weight loss. And I start to unpack what they are feeding the horse. And it's amazing to me how much stuff people are putting in to their horses in a form of a supplement that could be detrimental to them. I usually take them off of everything. But um, you know, while I'm trying to figure this out, I'm not saying supplements aren't good, but over supplementation is not. And and the referring vets oftentimes have no idea that the client had their horse on this many supplements because they put them on it because their friend told them or they read it somewhere or something. And, um, and it just really never came up in, you know, conversation. Um, again, you know, endocrine disease um, certainly is age dependent and there are high risk populations, you know, fat ponies, things like that ties in with the nutrition in looking at what you know, the horses are getting and making sure that if you have that pony or that horse that might be predisposed to insulin dysregulation, or they're getting to that age where you're worried about PPID, that you can really be very careful about their dietary, you know, their sugar intake and things like that, that they're eating before they get laminitis, before they have these problems. And also making um, yearly test recommendations there are still horses that I see that have been diagnosed with PPID and the owners actually are not aware that they're supposed to get that retested every year and, um, or, or even more than that in some cases. And I think that that's something it's very important that we, you know, continue to, to test them. Um, what about lab work? You know, obviously I'm here from, from Antec and I um, really think that yearly lab work is very important. You know, I go to my internal medicine specialist every year and have blood drawn and, um, but here are some of the questions like, well, how often is necessary and do we base that on their age? Like, you know, do you really need to do lab work every year in a young horse or their discipline, you know, what they're doing, a performance horse or a pleasure horse or backyard horse, retired horse, you know, and, and why are we doing this blood work? Like, what are we looking for? Is it just a general check? Is it endocrine? Um, one of the biggest questions that I get asked is, well, what if the horse otherwise looks good, but, and then I have an abnormality on the blood work, like, what am I supposed to do? You know, but Obviously, that's why we're doing it, and we have to know how to interpret some of those abnormalities. And are you catching something early, or is it something that we're not really worried about? And it might be just a wait and watch, like let's see what it looks like next year or in six months or whatever. And then also, you know, in house versus commercial lab. You know, should these, you know, to me, the yearly lab work, I for in house versus a commercial lab, you know, 
the commercial lab blood work, we have um, very strong, you know, quality control and all this kind of stuff in the big machines. And I think the in-house machines absolutely have a place. They have a place for, you know, uh, needing immediate blood work on very sick horses, on hospitals that need to have, you know, for surgery purposes and everything. But when you're doing general lab work, it's always better, in my opinion, to use a commercial lab, not just because I work for Antec, but because because we know the technology. The technology is is amazing in these you know big labs, and you cannot match that in a um, in a you know stall side or in house machine. So those are things to consider as well. Um, so what about client education on this? Again, when I went when I went to look this up, I was actually surprised that there is you know stuff out there in, in these magazines. You know that uh, I think that we're not taking the opportunity to. Um, follow up with this that that these you know um journals and and uh, magazines that are are catering to horse owners are really talking to the owners about this you know what a blood test can tell you we don't think much of having our blood drawn once a year um so why are we not doing this in our in our horses you know what should we be doing um blood tests in healthy horses. Why should we be doing that? So some of this is out there doing the work for us, but, but we've got to follow up with that. Um, I know this is kind of a busy slide and I, you know, um, I did try to circle some of these things, but, but this was a really good article. And this was uh, Nicole Pastrell. Ella, you know, who was uh, interviewed and what he was talking about was again, how it's not just like young horses that should have routine blood work, but that that we should be encouraging blood work yearly to just improve the well-being, you know? And then uh, what about competition horses? Like, we should be looking at that. Maybe we should be making sure that their red blood cell parameters and their muscle enzymes are normal. Um, and also in horses that are getting um, routine non-steroidals, bute, vanamine, equiox, whatever they're getting, we really should be looking at their renal parameters. You know, those, those drugs are not meant to be given on a routine basis. Oftentimes they are, and sometimes they really are needed, but we should be making sure that we are checking their, you know, organ function, specifically the renal parameters. And also older horses, they benefit from a regular CBC looking at, you know, what, you know, their inflammatory parameters, uh, blood cell count, fibrinogen, globulin, you know, and, and even what's important is to kind Kind of know where the horse is. You know there are differences in um, in breeds. I've looked at a lot of lab work now through Antec, and we know that um, warm bloods they tend to have lower white blood cell counts. But if you know for your particular horse that their white blood cell count tends to be around six, and then they're sick, and you know it's now eight or ten, even though it's in the normal parameter. Um, you know that that's high for that horse, or if it's 4,000, it's low for that horse. And I think just knowing where the horse sits normally can really help when we get lab work back to understand you know, those differences more clearly. Um, there are a lot of partners in promoting equine health that we can take advantage of. You know, On the AEP, I outlined a whole bunch of stuff on the AEP website. Um, uh, you know, commercial labs. We have a health program initiative that I'll talk about a little bit. But even things like insurance companies and supplement companies, you know, I was thinking about some of that stuff and I'll sort of explain that. Um, but, but I also think that, you know, doing just the, the general assessment and, you know, with all these things that we have does have an opportunity for the owner to just talk to you and bring forth concerns that they might not do during a visit where we, you know, where you're there for a colic or a choke or a lameness or whatever, because they're so hyper focused on that problem. And maybe they they forget to tell you something like, you know, oh, I've noticed my horse is dropping his food or he's law. Uh, lost muscle weight or he's just not himself or whatever it happens to be. So, you know, I think that's really important. Um, so this is our equine health program. And one of the things that, that we have done is um, I really took the time to listen to the struggles that practitioners had in um, sort of selling a health program 
And because of that, I developed and, you know, and, and worked with, keep with other practitioners and, and listening um, to try to figure out what it was that would be appealing to owners and realize that, you know, if we, if we just talk about routine blood work and we say, well, your horse needs a yearly CBC and chem, some people in their minds think, well, that's for a sick horse and my horse isn't sick, you know? So there, you know, back to the performance horse, if you say, well, we have this performance horse panel and this is going to look at your horse's red blood cell parameters, it's gonna look at the renal parameters, it's gonna look at the muscle enzymes, et cetera. To be honest, it's basically a, a deconstructed chemistry panel that's sort of packaged for the performance horse, you know? Um, and then what about the senior horse, you know? So now they have a senior horse. And if you say, we, you know, I'm gonna offer this senior blood work because your horse as a, as a senior horse not only needs a, a CBC in chemistry, but they, we should be looking at their endocrine profile and their insulin and endogenous ACTH. And then we have sort of the standard one that, that is just a CBC in chem and just called the equine health program. But, um, I've had, I've had a lot of feedback on the, especially the performance in the senior, that people really like that. And they felt like they could talk to their clients who had, you know, a performance horse or even a high level performance horse. And they feel that if they sell it in that way, that they are more comfortable, like, oh yes, yeah, my horse, you know, that's what he needs. You know, he's not sick, but we do need to look at these things. And then we sort of made it like, you know, optional with the Coggins, because maybe if it's a senior horse, they don't want a Coggins or, you know, whatever. So, so we've provided a lot of options. I don't have any pricing or anything on here, but we've certainly made it very competitive so that you, that practitioners could then go ahead and um, be able to sell it in an affordable manner to their clients. So if you you know, as an Antec client, you just talk to your territory manager and they could talk to you more about it. Um, one step further is that we created a brochure that you can hand to your clients that's about preventative health care so that you don't necessarily have to sit there and talk to each and every client about why you're recommending preventative health care. You can hand them this brochure, maybe talk to them about their your health care program, and they can look this over and think about it and decide, you know, what it is that that they you think they might want or what it is that you're offering. But we do have these brochures available for our clients so that it, you know, sells the conversation itself. You know, you don't have to talk to each and every one. So I mentioned insurance companies, you know, I mean, the thing about insurance companies is that a lot of them require a physical exam, some more than others, you know, some really don't require very much and others have a much more extensive list, you know. So if you have horses that are getting insured and you've got to do the insurance exam, well, you know, this could be a good opportunity. You know, they're not asking very specific questions, but if you do a good physical exam and then it's like, well, you can answer all of these because you've done a good physical exam, but, but it's, it's not just the insurance exam. It's more your exam that has been done. And then, you know, maybe there's a, a, a little charge for the insurance form or whatever it happens to be. But I think we could take those opportunities um, what about the supplement companies? I mean, the interesting thing about these that offer colic coverage, I'll talk about Platinum and Smart Pack. I think um, Arenas also offers one, is that, that they have very specific requirements. Like they're sticklers on what they require horses to have to be part of their program. And I, I think this is really good because they are making sure that like on the platinum one that you have a veterinary directed deworming program that's really helpful to us because if they want that colic care coverage they have to have the veterinarian do this you know and eat you know a, a vaccination program by a veterinarian um a dental exam by a veterinarian. And I will tell you, I was involved in a case that was through one of the colic care coverages and they are sticklers about this. They required um, everything to be filled out and certified before they would um, do the coverage. And it had to show that it was a veterinarian that performed all of these and that these were actually done. And um, and I, I think this is really pretty amazing because it it reinforces the importance that if you if we're if they're going to cover you 
for these programs that you really have to have, you know, a veterinary directed program. So, um, so th there's a lot here and there's a lot that I talked about, but I do understand that there are still obstacles. And I think some of the obstacles are perception of need again, which I think we as equine veterinarians need to do a, a good job, a better job of explaining to our clients why it's so important. Important, and I just outlined a lot of those reasons. What about the time to complete the comprehensive exam? You know, I've had a lot of conversations about, well, I don't have time to do a, you know, when I'm vaccinating and deworming to do a complete exam. You know, there's, I think for most practitioners, there's a slow time of year, you know, for us during the winter tends to slow down. So um, some veterinarians will uncouple their program where they'll do the vaccinations and deworming, but then during the winter months when they have more time, then they come out to do the comprehensive exam as a separate visit, you know, and wrap it into their program. So I think we have to make the time to do this and every practice is going to be different how they do it. But I agree, if you have to vaccinate a 30 horse barn or whatever, that's not the time to stop and do a complete comprehensive exam on every horse. You, you've got to figure out how to do it in the practice and just, you know, changing the conversation and, and talking about how in, you know, human medicine and even in small animal medicine, um, preventative healthcare is very important. And a, a lot of horse owners have dogs and cats and they're well aware that they bring their dog or cat to the veterinarian every year and they get routine exams and, and lab work and they don't always think about that for their horse. So I think we have good opportunities there. And then of course, you know, absentee owners. So I think um, sometimes it's really important to, to have the, uh, the trainers and the barn managers, when those people are on board, they sort of help direct with the owner. And so it's talking to everybody, not just the owners, but the trainers, the barn managers, and, um, you know, really making this uh, important. So, you know, what are the next steps? I mean, again, how can we as individuals promote and implement these within our own practices? And it's going to be different for everybody, but I think we as a profession should really think about this because we should be promoting better better preventative health care, better medicine, and not just always, you know, chasing the fire. Um, and I think that we, we need to work to change the perception and whether it's, you know, doing client seminars, sending out mailings, using the brochures, I mean, it's going to be different for every practice, but I think, um, I think it's something that's very important and, and it's worth making the time to do it. And it is how, we can regain the authority on equine health, I think, because what happens is, is if we are not part of the nutrition, the supplements, the body condition, all of these things, then we, we start to lose, you know, being the person that's doing the whole horse. And, um, and I think we're giving that away a little bit. So that's all I have. And um, I am happy to take, you know, any questions or, or comments and, you know, again, it is just a, br a brief overview, and I think it's worth it to go and look at some of these these resources. But I certainly learned a lot when I was putting this together because I was shocked on both ends on how little there is for guidelines from from our community, from AVMA. You know, um, AEP has it. I think you know they definitely have some stuff, but how it's actually out there a lot in the you know, to our, our clients and horse owners, and that we really need to take advantage of that.